Thank you, thank you very much, Jim, for the introduction and for setting this up and inviting us here uh, and, and for allowing, and uh, now's the time for turning off cell phones. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Well, kind of like the military. Can you hear him all right in the back? Yes. Okay, good. I, I asked June if a couple of friends could come and speak as well, so we are going to be privileged to have uh, three speakers today. Uh, we'll have uh, Dahlia Wasfi and Dave Lindorf uh, up here, so I'll try not, I don't know exactly how long I'm supposed to go with opening remarks, but I'll try not to go too terribly long, and then we can, I think, have, have discussion with the three of us. Um, I, I, I want to say a, a few words about my first book that came out in, uh, a year or more ago called Daybreak, uh, and, and a few about my new book, uh, War is a Lie, and a few about uh, what is happening right at this moment in the world. Um, when, when a lot of us were trying to impeach George W. Bush, uh, we were doing it despite rather than because of all the animosity and personal hatred of the individual person, George W. Bush. My concern, and many people's concern, was that all of the powers he was establishing for the presidency would be handed on to all future presidents. Uh, and this has been going on for a couple of centuries now, but this was an extreme case of a president taking vastly more powers than any of his predecessors and handing them off to the next guy and the next guy and perhaps a woman someday. Uh, and you know, when President McKinley sent troops into war abroad without Congress uh, and got away with it, people were killed, damage was done, but nothing to compare with what was done with that same power by future presidents. You know, all of the destruction that the CIA has done in the world, most of it is since Truman left office. Right? So arguably, it is at least as important how you leave the presidency as what you do while you're there. Uh, and, and in that regard, uh, whoever came after George W. Bush, as, uh, as John Dean, Nixon's lawyer, uh, who condemned Bush as far worse than Nixon predicted, was guaranteed to be the best or the worst, uh, and turned out to be the worst. Um, that, that is to say, Obama has not yet done the damage to the world that Bush did in his eight years, but he is at a worse place in terms of presidential power. He has taken many innovative abuses that were secretive and, and could have been treated as aberrations and in many cases were felonies and made them open public policy, written down and, and legalized and added to them so that we continue to move in the wrong direction and the third person in this series will be in a very difficult spot for even calling some of these things abuses, which 10 years ago were crimes. And so I was listening to, uh, to, to Meet the Depressed and you know, <laughs> in these shows on the drive up here and uh, I think it was, uh, uh, a woman who called in who said, you know, the thing about this, this new affair in Libya that, that, you, that you people don't understand is that Bush started it, and you've got to stop blaming Obama for everything. You know, I mean, people say that about Iraq and about Afghanistan after years of continued warfare there, but about a brand new war against one of Bush's friends? And so, at some point, we have to recognize what's been happening for the past two years. We have a military budget that went up every year Bush was there and has gone up every year Obama's been there. And greater use of secret military operations in at least 75 countries, more than Bush and Cheney ever had going on. And this is the department without accountability. This is where there's no auditing, there's no oversight, there are powers that Bush established to secretly move money to secret budgets uh, and, and use them without any accountability. And we have a deference to the military 
that's unprecedented. We have generals going on PR tours around the country, it publicly instructing the so-called commander-in-chief where, where to escalate a war and how much to escalate a war. We have a, a, a president who, who openly says he will do whatever the military wants. He will, he will cut the military budget where the military says he can. He will escalate the wars the military says to escalate. And when he's asked, is it okay to make a young man spend his life in a six by 12 cell and stand uh, at attention naked, he says, well, I asked the military and they told me it was. Right? It, it, this, is not, this is not unique to Obama. Right? When, when senators and think tankers and, and, and military officials went over to Afghanistan and were intentionally misled about so-called progress there by a unit of our military designed to misinform uh, foreigners, uh, and, and this was exposed, they said, well, the military should investigate itself. So th there's an incredible deference that the war in Iraq is not over. We're being told it's over. Uh, by the standard of Libya, with the Iraqi government shooting peaceful pro-democracy demonstrators, uh, it ought to be starting. Uh, we have 50,000 troops and we have a giant loophole. I mean, the, the Iraqi people, when they got this treaty from Bush and Maliki, should have talked to some Native Americans. The, the, the treaty requires that Department of Defense employees be out. We're going to have the State Department in with the biggest embassy in world history, big as the Vatican, with a mercenary force employed by the State Department. So they won't be Department of Defense, so we'll be in compliance with the treaty. If we decide to comply with the treaty, which does not appear all that likely. In Afghanistan, we've had a dramatic escalation of a war with no justification, increase in, in violence and destruction and death, and, an, and a dramatic increase in the use of drones in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And in Pakistan, so, to such an extent that you cannot, call it, you cannot call it anything other than a war. And of course, we haven't had even the pretense of a new debate or, or authorization of any sort from Congress for a war in Pakistan, where we are killing people today with drones. Uh, but we can't, you know, we have so many wars going on at this point. We're focused on Libya. Another. Uh, Another power uh, that has been declared out of this, of course, is the power to assassinate Americans, as long as they're abroad. But, you know, that, that will be a, treated as a technicality when an American is not abroad. Uh, th this is a, a president who Congress treats as having absolute war powers. We are going, this is, this is a, a president who campaigned on you cannot go into war no matter what unless it is with Congress and in defense of the United States of America. Right? Not, it doesn't matter if you have a UN resolution. This is a president who campaigned on we will end the mindset that let us go into a war in Iraq. And this UN resolution will be there for every future president. So no matter what we think or want to get ourselves to think about the current president, uh, and no matter how much or how little damage he does, we went into Iraq without any resolution that remotely justified it, under the pretense that there was one. Now we have a resolution that justifies anything in Libya that will be available to all future U.S. presidents in, in the near term at least uh, and is being used today. Um, uh, it, when, you, when you speak with people who will tolerate criticism of the current president, you often hear, but, but, but he closed Guantanamo. <laughs> and, you know, this was someone who came in without any intention of ending the policy of locking people up without any process or charge or trial, who stood in front of the Constitution in the National Archives and threw habeas corpus 
in the trash bin, but who had a plan to move one location where we do this, from Cuba to Illinois. And the fact that he can't do that is not of terrible interest to me. The fact is that a secret abusive policy under Bush has become a formal, open, public, and legalized uh, by presidential decree system of indefinite imprisonment. Well, he doesn't torture. Except that torture has continued in Guantanamo and Bagram and the US backed Iraqi government tortures people every day and we are torturing a young man 50 miles south of Washington DC named Bradley Manning and when our new CIA director had his confirmation hearing he openly said well the president can torture if he wants to he just might not want to. And the, and the president's advisor, David Axelrod, stood in front of the White House on network television and was asked four times, is Cheney telling the truth when he says that, that, that Obama maintains the power to torture? He just doesn't want to use it right now? And, and he wouldn't answer. Four times and he wouldn't answer. Uh, when, you, when you take something that was a crime, no matter how many times Congress pretended to recriminalize it, it had always been a crime before Bush and Cheney got to town. Uh, and you make it a policy, then it doesn't matter how much you use it, future presidents are going to use it more and it's going to be difficult to get rid of. This goes for the warrantless <laughs> spying that has been permanently fixed in place. I mean, when, when Eisenhower came in and didn't throw out the New Deal, it was pretty permanently fixed in place. When you have presidents of both parties engage in something, it becomes, it becomes fixed. And when they engage in a, a new power, the Supreme Court tends to treat that as a presidential power in the, in the following years. We, we have now unprecedented secrecy. They know much more about us. We know much less about them. We have, a, 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 Obama has set the record for rejecting Freedom of Information Act requests, for prosecuting whistleblowers, not counting the lawless imprisonment of whistleblowers. Uh, and and the, their response tends to be, yeah, but you can see the White House visitor logs. Except that you can't see the early ones that we don't want to show you with the, with the health insurance company CEOs when you started complaining. You can see the ones from a certain date forward that we think it appropriate for you to see. And all of our staff goes just off White House property to meet with the lobbyists so nothing shows up on the White House visitor logs. This is, this is the level of, of reform that we've got. And we have laws being made with executive order in a way that was, that was daring with Bush and normal now. The current president campaigned against signing statements. Do you all know what signing statements are? You sign a bill into law and write a note that says, here are the parts I'm going to violate. That was innovative for Bush and it was secret for most of the years Bush was there. And it became known and he kept doing it. Uh, and Obama campaigned against it and did it for, in exactly the same way for about the first six months and then decided he could do something worse. He could secretly, silently rely on previous signing statements if there was overlap or on secret memos written by the Justice Department. A few of, a few of those from the Bush years he released, many that we know of he didn't, uh, and, and who knows how many new ones in the past two years. Uh, <coughs> And the, the reform, as, as with releasing visitor logs or anything else, is I'll look into it and take care of it. So he promised to review all of Bush's signing statements and keep the good ones and throw out the bad ones, but not necessarily even tell us which ones, if any, had been thrown out. And then the next president presumably comes in and throws out some of Bush and Obama's laws and puts in some new laws. And it's, not, it's to do away with the legislature. Um, and, and so a, a lot of these, this accumulation of power in the hands of one person uh, is what I discuss in, in my first book, uh, Daybreak, um, the, the better part of which is 
proposals for solutions uh, up to and including amending our Constitution. Uh, taking the money out, taking corporate personhood out, take, reforming the media and the political parties, uh, and, and so forth. Um, we're at the point now where 66% of Americans, by several measures, are, are anti-war. 66% of Americans have told a number of pollsters, get out of Afghanistan. Not just I don't like it, or I oppose it, or I think it's not a good job, but leave Afghanistan with the military. And a few days ago, that got us 21% of the members of the House of Representatives. So you have to have a little bit over three times the public support of what you get in the House of Representatives. So if you do the math, I'm not a mathematician, but by my calculation, if we could get 162% of the public to oppose wars, we could end a war, right? I mean, which of course we don't need. 1% of the US public in Washington, DC, organized, determined, strategic, and nonviolent, and, and willing to risk injury and death, we could end war forever on this planet. Uh, you know, we don't need, we don't need a majority, and a majority isn't enough. Um, what we need, I think, is, is what we saw yesterday in Washington, D.C., when 113 of us went to jail at the White House for conveying the message of the 66% of Americans that we should get out of these wars. And many hundreds of people stood there and cheered and said, you're doing the right thing. We need more people to do the right thing uh, and it, it can be risking arrest, it can be disrupting, interrupting, protesting, vigiling, silently, educating, organizing. Uh, it, it, it can be talking to your neighbors. Uh, but if we had enough activism and the activism included aggressive resistance and interference with business as usual, we could do it. Um, the other problem with, with public opinion uh, is that it comes around too late. It's too slow. By arguably there was support, depending on the wording and how they pushed it, there was majority support for going into Iraq eight years ago. And there was majority support for going into Afghanistan. And now there isn't. Now you have a strong majority that says we never should have done it on either one. And you have a majority, you certainly have toleration for going into Libya. And, it, and so it comes around too late. And so I, I wrote a new book called War is a Lie because people were coming up to me and, and, and saying this war on Iraq just drives me crazy. To have, I mean, who ever heard of such a thing, a president lying about a war? This has never happened before. And you know, very intelligent, well-informed people who, who, who know all the details about the war on Iraq and are against it in, in just the right way. And, and treat it as brand new. And then other people who can name 18 wars that they oppose, but still think there might be a good war next month, you never know, right? Which all, all you need is that. All you need is that sliver of possibility that there might be a good war. There might be somebody evil enough or somebody sympathetic enough or a danger grievous enough that there would be cause for a war to continue putting over half of our public treasury into war, right? That's all you need. And, and so if we, if we can get to the point where we understand that there, you know, we don't talk about good slavery. We don't talk about just rape. We don't, there are things that we consider so evil that there's not the possibility that we're gonna need to bring them out in massive force. War is the very worst thing humanity has ever created and we talk as if we might need it and we have endless debates about the public budget that focus exclusively across the political spectrum on that minority of it that doesn't go to the military and we accept that we might need the military someday and, and so in war is a lie I, I, I don't go war by war through history which would be endless and repetitive but I look at types of lies uh, and pull examples. And uh, one type is that war is needed because sometimes there is something so evil in the world that nothing but war will address it. 
Um, and, and often it's a single person demonized. So if you listen to your, to your radio, as I did driving up here, you will, hear, you will hear great use of the first person plural, we, we did this, we did that, we sent missiles into Libya for, for the United States. It's never, you know, it's never he or him in reference to Obama bombed Libya. But for the other side, you'll never hear the use of anything plural. It's, it's he, he did this. We bombed him. It's, all, it's Gaddafi, as if Gaddafi is personally doing everything in Libya because there has to be this focus on the one person, the new Hitler, uh, who justifies military strikes. The, the, uh, 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 another very, very common but not universal excuse for wars is defense. Right? So we have to go halfway around the world to Iraq or Afghanistan to attack people to attack impoverished and unarmed nations in defense, in defense of the United States of America. The, the, the director of national intelligence was in a Senate hearing a couple weeks ago that got rather comical as they tried to get him to name a nation that could be a threat to the United States of America. And nobody could do it. They couldn't do it. Never mind that we're putting over half our money into preventing it in the so-called Department of Defense. They couldn't do it. The, the uh, National Security Advisor today on the radio asked what was actually asked after a bunch of, of very gentle softballs was finally asked, you know, is it really in our national interest to be uh, doing this in, in Libya? And he said, well, well, you know, Libya, look where it is. It's so close to us. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up. You can play back the, the, the tape. It's so close to us there in the Mediterranean. Now, presumably us somehow includes Europe, and this is NATO, uh, but it's not. Um, and, and the people who started this nation, albeit they saw it as a westwarding empire then, would have been outraged by the idea. Now, you know, Jefferson sent the, sent the Marines into Tripoli too, and it's in the Marine hymn. But the, the understanding uh, has, has developed over two and a quarter centuries that the globe should be sliced up into the Central Command and the Western Command, and, and we should dominate the whole thing, and it's all close to us. Um, another common, if surprising, justification for wars is generosity. Right? We have to bomb people for their own good. Um, we, we, you know, and, and soldiers come to understand that they're shooting up civilians for the civilians. And this, you, you go back and read what George W. Bush, uh, what George Bush the first said about going into to Kuwait and Iraq. You go back and, and look at what Clinton said, starting a war in Yugoslavia. Uh, and, and you look at, at the current affair in, in Libya. Uh, and it's, it's a humanitarian act of generosity, uh, which of course it isn't. Uh, and, and even in those instances where you could argue that some act of war did someone some good, you can't demonstrate anywhere where that's what motivated the act of war, uh, because it wasn't. Uh, and, and war, in the long run, does not do the world any good. The, the, so this idea of, of good wars is really what hangs people up. Right? The idea of, well, we, we had to have a revolution. Well, well, Canada didn't. Yeah, but we had to have a revolution. Well, we had to end slavery. Well, every other nation that ended slavery didn't use a war. Yeah, but we had to end slavery with a war. Well, we, we had to save the Jews. We just, we had to save the Jews. That was a good war, damn it. But the war had nothing to do with saving the Jews. They didn't try to save the Jews. They tried not to save the Jews. You can't find a single poster that says, I want you to save the Jews. Well, in retrospect, it looks better that way, and we had to save the Jews. You know, so at some point, you have, to get, you have to get beyond the idea that there could ever be a good war, and you're able to look at the, at the current particular wars, which are almost always bad in a better light. Um, you're also able to shut down the machine. You're, you're able to fund everything that every state government and every human being in this country has ever dreamed of and much beyond. And, and we could have the top quality education in the world free for all from pre-kindergarten through graduate school 
we could have the top quality health care for all free to, I mean, we could pay less than we're paying now and have that, but we could pay, we could have everything in the way of green energy and transportation and parks and, and, and everything you can imagine. Uh, we wouldn't even have to tax rich people, which is the other obvious solution. All you have to do is, you know, imagine if we just passed a bill that said we can't have a military more than three times the size of the next nearest competing military, right? They would never stand for it because we would have to take a huge chunk out of our military to get it down to three times China's military. We'd have to take 85% out to get it down to the size of China's military. We could take 85% of our military out and still have the biggest one in the world. And that ought to be good enough for some people. And in fact, there is majority opinion for taking a huge chunk of the money out of our military. Majority opinion is never Washington opinion. Um, the, the, other, the other problem with wars that, we, that I do address in the book that we don't look at much is that they are illegal. Uh, I, I mean, in this instance of getting a UN resolution uh, for a war, um, you know, there, there's, there's always going to be the argument of whether you're exceeding the resolution, which arguably we are, but you don't have congressional authorization. It's not constitutional. Uh, and when you don't have uh, defensive rationales and you don't have a UN resolution, it's illegal. Uh, and, and so, in 1928, our, our Senate, by a vote of 85 to 1, signed on to the Kellogg-Briand Pact with all the other countries that said, no more war, no wars. Uh, and our ambassador, Mr. Uh, our, uh, our, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kellogg, who was uh, our Secretary of State, I guess, uh, argued to, to uh, the foreign minister in France, Mr. Briand, you don't want to put in there definitions of what's aggressive war and what's good war and what's bad war and when can you have a war. You want to simply ban all war. Because if you put in an exception, it's going to be a loophole and it's going to be stretched and stretched until you've done nothing whatsoever. Well, our, our Senate tacked on two exceptions uh, and one of them was this traditional right of defensive wars. Uh, and, and then we got the UN Charter, which again, banned wars. Um, the the Kellogg-Briand Pact uh, quite noticeably did not work. Uh, and they put in two exceptions, defensive wars, and the UN gets to say some wars are okay. And as a result, we go fight defensive wars on UN resolutions halfway around the world with no sign of anything defensive and with the UN saying, no, we didn't. Uh, and nobody knows the exceptions have overtaken the rule, and nobody knows that the rule is war is illegal. Um, the conduct of war also allows exceptions that then become the norm. Um, a young man named Ross Caputi, who's standing in the back of the, the room by the window, uh, was speaking the other night about his experiences in, uh, in Iraq and used a term I wasn't familiar with called reconnaissance by fire. And I was uh, sitting in a van yesterday with my fellow uh, lawbreaker, Daniel Ellsberg, who was on his 81st arrest. Uh, and I asked Dan about reconnaissance by fire. And, and the story seems to be that in, in Vietnam, you generally assumed that there was the VC, the enemy, the bad people, hiding. And so you would shoot up villages. And if, they, and if someone fired back, then you knew then you had done your reconnaissance. There were, and if they didn't, then there weren't. Well, it seems in, in Iraq, in an urban context where you would assume everybody's a civilian, you shoot up buildings, and if anybody screams and moans, then there was people in there, uh, which is, is completely illegal, but is, is something that you know, makes its way into standard practice. The fact is that wars cannot be controlled. They cannot be clean and neat. They tend to expand once started. They hardly ever shrink or disappear. Um, war, there, there's this idea that you can't avoid wars sometimes and that you have a choice of nothing 
or a war. So in, in our president's speeches in recent days and in, in others, we, we, we hear this idea that, well, we couldn't do nothing, we couldn't stand by, so we had to have a war. And then we hear war was our last resort. We would never go to war as a first resort. In the same speech, in almost in the same breath, and yet no other resorts are mentioned or considered. No other possibilities are, are even thought about. The, the fact is that wars develop in accordance with their actual motivations, not the propaganda. Right? If we cared, if our government and the governments of France and Britain cared about the people of Libya, they would probably care about the people of Bahrain. They would probably care about the people of Yemen. We would probably demand a no-fly zone in Gaza. We would probably care about the people of Saudi Arabia and Egypt, Afghanistan and Iraq, where the, you know, you go to Afghanistan, where there are out, there's outrage and protest in the streets and in the government of the random killing of civilians in large numbers. Well, what are we going to do, bomb ourselves? We were providing support and weapons to Gaddafi up until the day we turned against him. Right? There's this idea that, well, should we intervene or not intervene? We're not intervening anywhere. We're deciding whether to continue supporting a dictator, as in Bahrain or Yemen, or to turn against him and side with somebody else, as in Libya. We're already intervened everywhere. Um, so the, the, the only possibility is that bad motivations, right? motivations related to the fact that there's oil in Libya, related to the desire to control the political situation, related to the desire to use and fund weapons, could have good results in a particular case. And I think it's, it's rather unlikely. Right? That there is a, a driving interest in control, in power, in resources, and people see that and resent it. And it allows someone like Gaddafi to start talking about us Libyans against the foreigners and to attract support to himself and to start handing out machine guns. This is going to build terrorism. We have predictably built terrorism through every year of the global war on terrorism. And this will add to it. And even if it doesn't, and even if we had the good intentions that people imagine when they think the US has had nothing to do with the Middle East and now we're intervening uh, for human needs, you're using violence. You're going to have a violent result. The fact is that over the past century, you look at the growing use of nonviolence, in many cases by people with, spontaneously with a very limited idea of, of training and, and strategy, and, and you have over twice the success rate as violence in undoing tyranny around the world. This isn't hypothetical anymore. And of course, we have already, in another little hypocrisy, we have already spent more bombing Libya then we were going to give NPR, right? We, 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 don't, we don't care because it's a war. If we were to, if we were to provide nonviolence, nonviolent strategy and organizing, American nonviolent strategists were advising Egyptians. Egyptians were studying Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, if we were to provide aid, purely humanitarian aid, if we were to announce the abandonment and the defunding and the demilitarizing of all the little puppet dictators around the Middle East, if we were to seek their indictments for their crimes, the message sent to the people and the government of Libya would be quite powerful. And if we were to join the International Criminal Court, if we were to join all of the dozens of treaties from the landmine treaty to the chemical weapons convention, if we were to encourage the people of the region to support nonviolent action in Libya, we could stop talking about new fly, no fly zones. We could start talking about no nuke zones. We could start talking about demilitarizing the Middle East, no weapon zones, no violence zones. We could stop our performance, our, our number one industry as the number one supplier of weapons to the world.
many of which weapons we end up fighting against with more weapons. War, war is not inevitable. It is never the best choice. It is always the worst choice. It is not in our genes. It is not very old in the long picture. It, it is certainly not more than 10,000 years old. Most human societies and cultures have not used wars. Many have done away with war. Many have limited war. Through a cold war, we avoided all out war to save the world. If you can avoid that in the big scheme, you can avoid it in a particular place as well. You just have to have the will to do it. And if women, after so many centuries of not participating in war, can join in, then why can't men get out? It's not in our human nature. War, war is over, <clears throat> if you want it. As John Lennon and Yoko Ono famously said, we can stop it. We have a Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C., the same name as Tahrir Square. When we, when we come to our senses, when we get as smart as the Egyptians and others, and, and we mobilize the way it needs to be done, we can end war now and forever. Thank you.